Hola, buenos días, eh, buenas tardes, según desde donde nos estén viendo. Mi nombre es Carolina López y soy representante de UNEPFI en Chile y también coordino las capacitaciones de UNEPFI a nivel global. Les damos una muy calurosa bienvenida al webinar sobre cambio climático y GCFD, riesgos y oportunidades para las aseguradoras en España y en América Latina que está organizado por UNEPFI, por el Banco Interamericano de Desarrollo, el BID, y por el Centro de Finanzas Responsables y Sostenibles de España, FINRES. El evento cuenta con la colaboración de la Federación Interamericana de Empresas de Seguros, FIDES, con la Mesa Público-Privada de Finanzas Verdes de Chile, la Mesa de Finanzas Sostenibles de Bolivia, la Iniciativa de Finanzas Sostenibles de Ecuador, el Grupo de Trabajo y Finanzas Sostenibles de Panamá, la Embajada Británica de Santiago, Acción Climática, Lab, Laboratorio de Innovación Financiera de Brasil, el Laboratorio de Innovación Financiera de México y los Media Partners Comunicarse, Diario Sustentable y País Circular. Estamos muy contentos de unir fuerzas con tantas instituciones en esta iniciativa. Esta actividad forma parte como continuación de una serie de tres webinars sobre cambio climático y GCFD para el sector bancario que realizamos a finales del año pasado en la unión de fuerzas de todas estas instituciones y las presentaciones, las grabaciones de los vídeos están disponibles en nuestra página web. Este webinar se impartirá en español e inglés con traducción simultánea a ambos idiomas gracias al apoyo del BID en el icono del mundo Interpretation, interpretación que pueden ver abajo a la derecha, pueden seleccionar traducción simultánea al idioma que deseen. Este evento presentará los aspectos más relevantes del trabajo realizado durante el proyecto piloto de aseguradoras adheridas a los principios de seguros sostenibles, los PSI de UNEPFI, y que han seguido las recomendaciones del grupo de trabajo eh, sobre las divulgaciones financieras relacionadas con el clima, el GCFD, y en dicho piloto UNEPFI ha colaborado con 22 aseguradoras y reaseguradoras líderes de todo el mundo, lo que representa más del 10% de la prima del sector global. El grupo colaboró en el desarrollo de metodologías para evaluar el impacto financiero que los riesgos físicos de transición y de litigios pueden tener en sus carteras de suscripción. Las presentaciones que hoy veamos, así como la grabación de este webinar, se subirán también a nuestra página web y eh, vamos a enviar por email a todas las personas eh, que se hayan inscrito el link eh, con todas estas informaciones. Durante el evento de hoy podrán compartirnos sus preguntas y comentarios para los expositores a través de la sección de Q&A, de preguntas y respuestas, las cuales vamos a tratar de responder al final en el espacio de preguntas y respuestas. Y en esta sección de apertura vamos a contar con unas breves palabras de los representantes de las instituciones coorganizadoras. Así que voy a dar paso ahora a Eric Asher, que es el director de UNEPFI. Eric, welcome and please go ahead. Uh, well, thanks very much, uh, Carolina, and, and good morning and good afternoon, everyone, and, and a pleasure to be with you, and a particular thanks to uh, Juan Jose Durante from uh, IDB and Pilar González de Frutos from uh, UNESPA for, for the, uh, uh, the cooperation um, in uh, carrying out this, uh, this webinar. Um, this work around climate risk disclosure um, has, as, as I think as you're probably all aware, developed considerably in the last couple of years since it was uh, first launched by um, um, uh, at, at COP um, in Paris, COP 15, 2015, uh, excuse me, COP 21, um, and um, around the realization that unless we understand the risks that um, a change in climate, both in terms of physical changes of climate change, but also um, transitional Um, uh, changes in terms of changes in policy, changes in technology, and what impact that has on our business, um, uh, widely in the private sector and particularly in the financial sector, that's critically, it's critical for coming to terms with understanding uh, where the exposures lie um, and where risks need to be managed. Um, and so what we've seen is, is the, the task force on climate uh, uh, Financial Related Climate Disclosure, as TCFD in English, um, put out a set of recommendations on um, how disclosures should be done 
but as you're probably all aware, uh, they're quite high level and there's a lot of um, detail is lacking in terms of how exactly to carry it out. And particularly the, the forward looking nature of doing scenario analysis is, is quite challenging. Some would call it crystal ball gazing and trying to understand how the sectors that, that you're operating in, that you're financing, how they will change, how they will be affected, how that will provide um, uh, impact um, on your portfolio, on your exposures. And therefore, uh, what we found is working through our global membership of banks, of uh, insurers and investors, that there was a real need to work together within the industry to come up with approaches, voluntary approaches for how you, you, you're going to, the methodologies to apply in, in making these disclosures. And, and uh, this has been uh, implemented across the different industries. And we found it's had a real impact on, on assisting um, financial actors to uh, both make their own disclosures, but also work together in what we call a form of, of soft norm creation on establishing industry positions on how best to do um, aspects of disclosures, for particularly um, scenario analysis. Um, so we're really pleased um, to have brought together a, a global group of 22 leading insurers and reinsurers um, to come up with a common methodology of how to do disclosures and to look both at, at physical risk of climate change, the transition risks, and also liability risks. It's the first major effort to try to understand uh, what kind of exposures can come um, uh, uh, from the legal um, responses to climate change. Um, Carolina has spoken a little bit um, about uh, the, the group that's been operating. It's global, but now a big part of our work is how does it get implemented? Who, who can make use of these methodologies that have been developed? Learning from each other, learning from, from leaders in the field. We're very pleased to have uh, Manuel L'Enfant from UNIPFI, uh, who's going to be presenting um, the, the overall pilot um, and um, essentially the, you know, the objectives, the research and, and the major outcomes um, to the work. And then AXA and NN Group, are who actively participated in the insurance pilot, will share their experience. Um, and at the end, uh, we'll have uh, industry supervisors, IAIS and IOPA, provide the critical regulatory view. And as we are starting to see across the different parts of the financial industry, the regulators are learning from what the private sector is leading on, but also um, um, starting to, to become, provide a much larger role. And in some markets, we are seeing mandatory disclosures, uh, mandatory forms of, of how to do scenario analysis. Um, so the relationship with the regulators is critical and I'm very pleased to have them involved today. So with that, um, I hand it back to Carolina and, and wish well for a very successful webinar and, and for us to move forward into a, um, a more better nuanced understanding of what climate means uh, to our institutions, to our organizations, and how we can help navigate our economies, our communities towards a, a low carbon climate resilient future. Thank you. Excelente. Muchas gracias, Eric. Ahora voy a dar uh, la palabra a Juan José Durante, que es líder de mercados financieros del BID. Adelante. Muchas gracias, Carolina, Eric. Eh, buenos días a todos desde Washington. Eh, buenas tardes para los que estén en Europa o en otros lugares de, eh, de aquella zona. Eh, eh, gracias por la posibilidad de participar en la apertura de este evento. Eh, para el Banco Interamericano de Desarrollo eh, es una gran oportunidad colaborar con la UNEP, el Centro de Finanzas Sostenibles y Responsables de España, Fides y muchas instituciones relevantes, así como la industria aseguradora y, y los entes supervisores de la región. Eh, el compromiso institucional del BID eh, para apoyar a los países a enfrentar el desafío del cambio climático no solo comprende aumentar fuertemente el volumen de financiamiento a América Latina y el Caribe relacionado con el clima para contribuir a la reducción de emisiones y, y la creación de resiliencia, sino también nos enfocamos fuertemente en apoyar a los gobiernos en las políticas públicas, la innovación, ¿no? iniciativas público-privadas y la generación de conocimiento eh, dirigido ¿no? a, a mejorar la gestión de riesgos climáticos y enfrentar el desafío del cambio climático. Eh, estamos convencidos que el rol de la industria aseguradora es clave 
Eh, en este sentido, el BIP promueve soluciones basadas en, en mercado, eh, el involucramiento eh, de la industria eh, para colaborar junto con los gobiernos, para buscar soluciones a, a estos desafíos que enfrentamos. Eh, en ese marco, eh, de vuelta, eh, promovemos eh, el desarrollo de, de coberturas, trabajamos con, con los reguladores, este, y, y pensamos que, que todo lo que es las alianzas público-privadas son claves para poder este, dar un paso para adelante eh, en todo lo, lo, lo que nos vamos enfrentando para la gestión de, del cambio climático y, y los riesgos que afectan a nuestros países y a nuestras comunidades. Eh, en ese sentido, en la región, eh, estoy muy contento de que se haya podido llevar este evento eh, con FIDES, por ejemplo, con la Asociación de Supervisores de Seguros de América Latina, eh, con España, eh, con, con, con el ente supervisor, la Dirección General de Seguros, el Consorcio de Compensación de Seguros. Eh, el banco busca permanentemente crear alianzas para dar más potencia a, a los apoyos que podemos brindar eh, a la región. Eh, entonces, bueno, estamos muy contentos de, de hoy compartir esta mañana con ustedes en este evento y, y, y consideramos que el estudio de UNEP y del grupo de aseguradoras adheridas a los principios de seguros sostenibles eh, que se ha presentado durante el evento es sumamente relevante para seguir impulsando eh, el rol del sector asegurador y promover oportunidades para, para el sector. Entonces yo quiero que directamente, entonces si te parece Carolina, pasemos, eh, continuamos con el evento, eh, así que nuevamente un placer estar con ustedes y esperemos que aprovechar este, todas las presentaciones que tenemos durante la mañana. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias Juan José, para nosotros el apoyo de ustedes y poder colaborar con el BID es muy importante, son un socio estratégico de UNEPFI. A continuación voy a dar la palabra a Pilar González de Frutos, ya es presidenta de la Unión Española de Entidades Aseguradoras y Reaseguradoras, UNESPA, que forma parte de FINRES, eh, que es Supporting Institution de UNEPFI eh, desde el año pasado y con dicha institución hemos eh, también colaborado eh, bastante desde, desde el año pasado. Así que bienvenida Pilar y adelante. Muy buenos días. Para mí es un auténtico placer estar con ustedes, compartir este webinar, aunque sea de manera telemática y hacerlo en esta apertura con eh, líderes tan relevantes como los que me han precedido en el uso de la palabra. Hoy me voy a dirigir a todos ustedes, no solo en calidad de presidenta de UNESPA, la Asociación Española de Aseguradoras, sino también en calidad de representante de FINREP. Como probablemente sepan, FinREPS es el Centro de Finanzas Sostenibles y Responsables de España. Se trata de una iniciativa impulsada por las cinco principales asociaciones del sector financiero en mi país. Organizaciones empresariales que representan a las entidades de crédito, las instituciones de inversión colectiva los fondos de pensiones, cooperativas de crédito y, naturalmente, las aseguradoras. Si tengo la suerte de estar hoy aquí con ustedes es por la misión fundacional de FinREPS. El objetivo de esta organización es concienciar a los agentes económicos y a la sociedad en general sobre los retos y oportunidades del desarrollo sostenible, capacitar al tejido productivo español en general y fundamentalmente a las pequeñas y medianas empresas para transitar hacia una economía sostenible. Apoyar la identificación de soluciones financieras que contribuyan a ese cumplimiento y promover fórmulas innovadoras que vinculen sostenibilidad y financiación. Participar en foros como este permite precisamente a FinRED estar al día en las mejores prácticas existentes en materia de finanzas sostenibles y aportar su granito de arena al debate público. Se constituyó esta plataforma en 2019, pero la realidad es que ha sido 2020 el primer año de vida como tal del centro. El año que acabamos de dejar atrás ha sido un ejercicio muy complejo, bien lo saben, pero no ha parado los pies a FinREPS. Al contrario, 
si algo se ha conseguido en el 2020 ha sido poner de relieve la pertinencia de un proyecto que ni siquiera con un contexto tan adverso como el generado por la pandemia ha logrado parar. Yo incluso me atrevería a decir que la crisis sanitaria lo ha puesto en valor, ya que es uno de los pilares en los que se asienta, al menos en Europa, el ambicioso proyecto de reconstrucción. Para el año 21 tenemos como objetivos contribuir a la generación de oportunidades que permitan la transformación sostenible desde las finanzas, convertir FinReps en el repositorio de conocimiento clave sobre finanzas sostenibles en España y ser un elemento de valor para las entidades financieras. Este rosario de iniciativas es fiel testimonio de la voluntad que tenemos, de la vocación por convertir a FinReps en un punto de encuentro, debate, sensibilización y experimentación de los grupos de interés de la industria y de los servicios financieros. Si me lo permiten, y tampoco deben extrañarles porque soy presidenta de UNESPA y por tanto miembro activo en FIDE, me gustaría dedicar unas palabras antes de finalizar mi intervención a la importancia de la sostenibilidad en la gestión aseguradora. El primer elemento que me gustaría poner en valor es el asunto de las actuaciones ligadas a la transición ecológica como elemento estratégico para el sector asegurador en el que nos encontramos totalmente involucrados. No estamos ante una moda o una tendencia pasajera. La sostenibilidad importa en el seguro y mucho. Y aunque pudiera parecer que el seguro contamina más bien poco, creo que tiene para nosotros muchísimas cosas que decir y que hacer en este terreno. El seguro puede utilizar la suscripción de seguros en favor de la sostenibilidad. Es especialmente visible en el caso de los seguros medioambientales. El asegurador, como un buen conocedor de los riesgos, conoce cuáles son las medidas que se pueden tomar para evitar y mitigar incidentes dañinos en el medio ambiente. En el proceso de suscripción, por tanto, puede operar como un proveedor de prevención, ayudando a los clientes a mejorar su propia gestión sostenible. El seguro no puede impedir que los sucesos climáticos ocurran, pero al menos puede evitar que cuando tienen lugar esos acontecimientos adversos dejen a quienes lo sufren sin recursos para poder afrontar el futuro. También tenemos un papel que jugar en las acciones en favor de la sostenibilidad en nuestra faceta de inversores institucionales. Somos ese socio que apoya los ambiciosos objetivos del Pacto Verde con el fin de construir una economía más sostenible, libre de emisiones de efecto invernadero para el 2050 y que se enfrenta a los riesgos emergentes derivados del cambio climático. Y estas son, bien lo saben todos ustedes, las metas que también se ha marcado Europa para mediados del presente siglo. Y el seguro puede contribuir a conseguirlas. Podemos, por tanto, ser un actor importante en el reto de financiación de la transición ecológica y de la construcción de una economía descarbonizada y más justa. El sector asegurador puede jugar un rol clave en la transición hacia la sostenibilidad invirtiendo en activos verdes. Sin embargo, somos únicamente una parte del esfuerzo total a realizar para conseguir esa economía sostenible. En último lugar, también deben tener presente que el seguro tiene mucho que decir en el cumplimiento de muchas otras de las metas de los Objetivos de Desarrollo Sostenible de Naciones Unidas. Y cuando digo esto, estoy pensando también en objetivos no relacionados exclusivamente con factores ambientales, sino también en los ligados a factores sociales y de gobierno. Desde el seguro podemos contribuir a su cumplimiento aprovechando esos diferentes roles que podemos adoptar, ya sea como asegurador o inversor o como empleador o promotores de acciones de carácter social. No me extiendo más, 
Espero que estas breves palabras les hayan podido permitir situar el papel que juega FinREP en materia de sostenibilidad en la industria financiera española y la relevancia que tiene para las aseguradoras a las que represento la sostenibilidad en la gestión cotidiana. Deseo que sea tremendamente provechoso el contenido de este webinar y les agradezco su atención. Estupendo. Muchísimas gracias, Pilar, y también Eric y Juan José, nuevamente, por sus inspiradoras palabras y también por mostrarnos lo que están haciendo en esta temática desde cada institución. A continuación, les voy a presentar a mi colega Manuel Lonfat, que es líder de programa piloto de aseguradoras de UNEPFI, siguiendo las recomendaciones de GCFD. Él nos va a presentar los objetivos y resultados alcanzados en dicho piloto. El reporte fue publicado eh, la semana pasada, está disponible en nuestra página web de UNEPFI. Así que adelante, Manuel. Thank you very much. So good morning, everyone. I'm going to turn off the camera for bandwidth, but I thought I would show my face uh, for a few seconds before I do that. So, uh, so here we go. So thanks for your time. I uh, appreciate uh, being here. I'm very excited to speak about the project. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not quite the, the chief of insurance. I think that would be Butch, Butch uh, uh, who's, uh, who's running PSI for, for UNIPFI, but I'm uh, focused on TCFD issues for UNIPFI and uh, particularly, of course, in the insurance side. So if you can move us to the next slide. What I want to do today is uh, to give you an overview of the project. Obviously, this was a project that ran for uh, more than a year. And uh, we ended up with a, a very large report, very technical, and trying to cover that in about 10, 15 minutes is going to be, it's going to be really difficult. But let's start with the objectives. Number one, what we, we have aimed to do is to develop methodologies that can be used to assess and disclose climate risk, underwriting risk. So the, 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 the work here has been focused on underwriting risks, but also opportunities in the context of the TCFD recommendation. Uh, we aim to help the, the, the market, if you wish, move towards a harmonized set of, of disclosures and methodologies to support disclosures, which is key, key to the transparency behind this framework. And ultimately with the group of insurers who have been involved in the project, we want to signal the support for this yeah, FSB uh, work on, on climate transparency. So let's move to the next slide, please. Carolina touched on that a few minutes ago. So we had uh, in this project about 22, not about exactly 22 members participating. You see the footprint about everywhere. Uh, we did not have uh, members in Latin America, but we had members in, in Spain, my friend. And uh, the, the, the spectrum reached uh, all confines from very, very large insurers to regional and sub-regional insurers, Canadians, Australians, Asians, and Europeans. Uh, we worked with uh, the advice of PwC, helped us with the methodological aspect. And on the litigation side, which is very new to this project, we worked with the Columbia Law School, the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law, a very, uh, very leading institution in the context of climate change litigation. Next slide, please. So I want to start with a high level view of the framework that was developed and that we are using uh, consistently across the various risks to, uh, to, to address financial impact. We start by uh, laying out the sort of the context, the climate scenarios. I will go into more detail, but that, that's the really first uh, element that, uh, that we need to, to look at in the context of, of, of forward-looking applications. Then number two is uh, thinking about where are the, the, the key risk zones. So when you think about uh, what are the hotspots in different time frames and different uh, expectation for scenario for temperature, temperature trends in the future. And then the, the third is then once we have identified that, pick some of those hotspots and work our way to the financial impacts all the way to potentially um, I know, economic terms and, and financial uh, insurance term impacts. 
what makes this work uh, different? So number one, we are looking at it from a multi-risk standpoint. So we are uh, looking at physical risk, number one, but we're also looking at transition risk. And as it was noted, we are looking also at litigation risk, which is sort of very much uh, out there and important, but not yet uh, very much addressed in, in this kind of project. So uh, next slide, please. So now let's, uh, let's drill down a bit into some of the components, starting with the first one, so the climate scenarios. So what we, we uh, look to do here is identify a set of scenarios which project us out on a certain number of timeframes and on a, on a, a number of uh, potential targets. So in our case, we picked three scenarios, uh, three, three, time, three potential targets, sorry. One was uh, the case where no action are taken or very limited action are taken. And we're looking at an impact of maybe three to four degree of a pre-industrial temperature. Uh, then in the middle, we're looking at a case where actions are taken, but there's, there's just not enough or not quick enough to limit the worst impact. And we end up maybe in the two degree range. And then the last one is, is a situation where we really take uh, strong and rapid actions to uh, affect uh, the situation. And we end up in a, an area called, in this case, well below two degree C. Why those three uh, sort of, uh, aspects of these three scenarios, because uh, we believe that it's important to look at the interplay, but at the same time, those risks in the context of insurance are going to play out differently and to different, uh, to, to different magnitudes, depending what we do. So if we take really strong and quick actions, we will see uh, certainly a lot of transition risk. So uh, that's the, the well below two degree target. If we take no action at all, then we really limit the the, the transition risk, but we are going to likely face very, very large physical risk. But there is this interesting interplay in between where both, both risk transition and physical play a role. On top of that, uh, of course, litigation is likely to be part of the equation in most cases, um, sort of uh, hitting on different aspects of the problem. If we don't act, for example, then there may be a, there may be a litigation risk associated to to, uh, to the lack of response. If we act uh, strongly, there may be um, other, other risk li uh, linked to what kind of actions we take and, and whether they are appropriate. So the scenarios we use are from uh, the IEA, so the International Energy Agency and, and the IPCC, uh, in the case of IPCC, RCP 4.5 for the two degree range and RCP 8.5 for the four degree range. So let's move to the next slide. So uh, if you think about the slide, uh, two slides ago, there were three elements. First, uh, the context with the scenarios. And then uh, from there, we are looking at identifying what we can call the hotspots, the risk hotspots. We did that both on the physical side and on the tr transition side independently using a slightly different methods. So this slide and the next one show you uh, what uh, the risk levels are at a very coarse level. So high risk, medium risk, low risk in uh, many of the Latin American countries and Spain as well on the next slide. And uh, this is done for two time frames, So 2030 and 2050. And uh, in that case, two temperature range. So two degree or also called two DS here and four degree or also called four DS here. And nine different uh, type of hazard risk. So from heat wave, cold waves, so the, the, the chronic type of risk to the, the acute type of risk, the catastrophes of the world. And uh, so maybe one thing to notice is uh, the, the flood in particular, the flash flood is, is quite a prominent risk, pretty much uh, everywhere. And uh, it has to do, of course, with urbanization and increased concentration of risk and and water flowing in, in some new paths and, and the increase in precipitation of all that, uh, that is likely to happen in many areas. So we'll jump to the next slide for, for a second. So this is the second part of, uh, of, of the, the, that list of countries that I mentioned. What I also want to, to state is that this data is, uh, is at a pretty coarse resolution. So we start with public data we uh, worked through the entire analysis, 
the methodology with that public data. So the data is at the country level. So it is not meant to represent the risk on any particular portfolio and certainly uh, internal work is needed on top of that to really identify where the risks are for someone who's writing at a very granular level, for example, within some of those countries. But hopefully it's, it gives the market an indication of what those big sort of ticket items, big hotspot zones are. So let's move to the next slide, please. So then on the transition side, so same idea, we developed a heat map. Uh, it starts from a different point. So when, when we look at physical, we start from the, the hazard. We start from the weather. And then we look at how these impact the exposure and how these impact the vulnerabilities and put it to, all together to get to a loss. When we look at transition risk, we start with uh, the line of business. And then we look at uh, the sectorial impact that, uh, that, that can come with some particular stress on the portfolio. And then ultimately we, we pass that at the regional level without going to high resolution. In this case, we remain uh, within, uh, within continental type, type framework for this analysis. So uh, there's a little bit here about Latin America. This is just one case. It is two degree uh, temperature change at about 10 years out, 2030. So there's a lot more data sitting uh, be be behind this model that is not, not shown here. But uh, the, the model identify chemicals, for example, as, as an opportunity for Latin America on the ancient side, both property and liability. So this is linked to the fact that uh, um, the model starts in the IEA framework. It is believed that uh, uh, the, the area may, may see more volume, more growth from, uh, from the differential in production costs. And then uh, generally speaking everywhere, the liability uh, framework is assumed to become more intense. And uh, so you see that as well in the area. But again, just a sample output uh, and more needed in order to really uh, make this actionable at the portfolio level. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, so once we have done uh, one and two scenario uh, decision on what scenario to use to, uh, to drive the forward looking view and to apply that at a fairly cost level to figure out what are the zones, the type of perils, the type of lines of business that matter. Then the idea is to pick some of those higher risk zones or higher risk uh, lines of business and, and start drilling down into the potential financial impact, which ultimately uh, would be part of a disclosure process. So uh, the first step to that, to that is, is once the situation is determined, uh, we need to build uh, what we call impact pathways. So given a risk or a stress on, on the portfolio starting to the left, then uh, the question is what kind, how this, how this stress can trickle to the portfolio. So a risk, for example, a physical side may be uh, a change in the profile of uh, tropical cyclones or a change in the profile of, of severe uh, rainfall events. And then, uh, and then the, at the sector level is how is that impacting the severities of damage potentially on a, on a property look of business. And then what are the lines that are exposed, residential, some aspect of commercial potentially. And then uh, from there on, how is that uh, impacting the portfolio? What kind of metrics you want to look at as an insurer and what are you going to do uh, down the road on a strategic standpoint uh, with that information in order to either adjust or look at opportunities and, and particularly monitor it. So let's go to the next slide. So in the context of this study, of course we couldn't uh, grasp a lot of those cases. So we picked five situations to really drill down on, on the financials and develop the methodologies that ultimately led us to developing spreadsheet models to, to, uh, to work out the financials. On the physical side, we chose three different cases. We looked at flood in Canada and flood in Europe, two different types of flood. In Canada, it's a uh, storm surge type related flood, but also inland flooding, river, in, river rain flooding floods, so related to, to rivers. 
In Europe, we looked at uh, urban type floods, so closer to, to the idea of flash flood, if you wish. Then uh, we also looked at uh, tropical cyclones, both in the US and in, um, and in Japan. So the, the three cases here, if you wish, are flood in Canada, flood in Europe, different type of flood, and then tropical cyclone across those two regions with the same components. So the exhibit on the right, which is very tiny, I, I get that, is, an is a sample output of the models that we built. The model essentially built on the idea that uh, the insurer starts with a series of uh, losses, which could be through a model or it could be through an analysis of uh, their own experience with events uh, similar to those in the past. And then those events are stack ranked according to their chances of occurrence. So in this uh, in this exhibit, you see the return period, for example, because this is applied to a tropical cyclone. There is a model behind it, a catastrophe model, and uh, and we have access to the information that, for example, goes up to a thousand year return period. And then uh, and then the idea of the model is that it takes the losses according to a, a cat model, a catastrophe model, or an experience. Uh, uh, of losses in the portfolio and apply adjustment factors to capture changes in the hazard itself. So in the case of tropical cyclone, it would be uh, cyclone frequency, cyclone severity, level of rainfall, uh, sea level changes, things like that. And then, uh, and then look at that forward in different scenarios of future temperature and, and behavior. And so the bottom, uh, the bottom right plot there shows you an example of output, increased risk uh, in two different periods, two different uh, type of tension patterns. But again, just a sample, a lot more behind that. If you go to the next slide. Thank you. On the transition side, we looked at uh, two situations. One is changes in, in energy production across Europe, focusing on France and Poland in this case. And then we looked at um, risk and opportunities with a changing portfolio of building in the real estate space in Australia. And so here the, the sample output becomes even more uh, sort of based on a bit of fictional data, not a real portfolio if you wish, but we are looking at a pretty complex portfolio of uh, energy contracts in Europe and uh, the, the output of this model is, has to do with profitability of different lines of business, changes in volume, changes in uh, premium and, uh, and, and growth opportunity. So the model output uh, showed some potential opportunities in the real estate space in Australia, but uh, we thought to, to, to capture short-term uh, trends like we, we are facing now with the COVID situation. So there's still work to be done on that, but the model exists there. You can inject your, or, or put your own portfolio in the structure and, and uh, see what comes out of it. Next, please. So I'm already running out of time, I feel. Uh, so very quickly on the litigation approach, we looked at two methodologies. One we developed internally with the working group, uh, starting with risk management um, uh, principles. And the second is uh, we, we engage with the Bank of England, which is looking at the same problem from a very different angle, working with stress test scenarios. And so I won't touch on the second one, but if you, if you happen to come to our seminar, on our, our webinar, our global webinar in about eight days so on February 11, we will have the Bank of England discuss uh, this methodology in more detail. But think of it uh, as context, what would happen in uh, the narrative structure in a north side type of assessment where you start with a situation that you assume happened and then you try to figure out what is the exposure on, on your portfolio. So let's go to the next slide. So in the risk management structure though that we developed uh, internally to this working group, we started with the database for the, from the seven centers. It's a great database to start looking at. It contains uh, pretty comprehensively all the, the, the climate change related litigation cases that are unfolding or have unfolded around the world. A lot of, it, of them happen in the US, but uh, Australia um, and UK are also seeing quite a bit of activity in farther than Brazil, for example. 
um, the, the Latin America region seems to have less cases. Naturally, these are not all the cases that uh, are, are relevant for the insurance industry. This is all the cases. And some work is needed to narrow down on insurance cases. So uh, in the insurance space, we haven't seen really yet uh, cases where, where insurers have been directly involved in litigation. But the financial industry is starting to see some, 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 uh, some activity. For example, uh, recently there was a case settled in Australia for the pension fund. And uh, the situation was uh, the, the pension fund is called REST. So retail employees, um, super annuity trust, and they were sued for uh, on the premise that they are not taking uh, the, the climate change seriously enough in their investment decision and they're not reporting enough on it. And they actually lost. And uh, there was no, uh, no money consideration in, um, in, in the discussion, but they are to take actions on their reporting side and on how they think about this with their external uh, money managers and so on. So one more slide, please. So in the context of the risk management approach, um, so this is a classic risk management type structure. We start, uh, we, we have three components here. Uh, you're looking at litigation. We start with trying to figure out what the likelihood uh, will be that a litigation case is brought relevant to the insurance industry. And then, uh, and then we, we uh, look next at what is the chance that that litigation rule in favor of the plaintiff. And then uh, third is uh, an assessment of the cost of remedy. So we haven't gone all the way to developing this methodology, but we developed the framework and an opportunity is really to, to, to further develop that and quantify those down to the financials. So next, please. The type of cases that we are using to, um, to feed this analysis. So uh, three, three, really three cases there. Litigation due to fossil fuel production. So it's an obvious. It's the, the sort of polluters, if you wish, of the world. And uh, insurance contracts on, on energy production linked to, uh, to uh, emissions. Then the second is the litigation pertaining to, to uh, physical implications of climate change. So this could be a situation where you actually have a catastrophe. A good case is is a uh, climate change, potential climate change ramification in wildfire cases in, uh, in California, for instance. And uh, third is litigation pertaining to breaches of regulatory framework. And the case in Australia is relatively close to, to that bracket. Next slide, please. So quickly to, uh, to wrap uh, observation and opportunities. So on the observation side, uh, what, what we see is obviously the insurance, insurance is very complex. And in order to create standards, it's, it's going to be a long road. It needs a lot of work. We started in this work with economic impacts, but we realized that we need to go farther. For example, looking closely at financial terms in contracts. But uh, we believe it's important to look at all the risks at once, physical transition, litigation, and build frameworks based on forward-looking information that enable to capture all of those and understand the interplay between them. And so that multi-risk approach is very important. Now at a more detailed level, uh, I would say some of the opportunities right in front of us could be to do life and health work. A lot of what I described is in property space. A lot of the work we have done is in property space, but uh, we, uh, we are interested in, in potentially looking at life and health and then call out to uh, Anyone on, on this call who is interested to engage with us or, or learn more, please, please connect with us. So capture financial terms and condition, I mentioned that. And ultimately portfolio level approaches, the sort of systematic risk is, 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 is what matters to look at. So it's good to look at silos, but then we need to find a way to put it together to leverage uh, uh, the, the correlation, negative correlation, but also to understand positive correlation. In the, so potential systematic risk. Next slide, please. And so I will close on that. Here is information about us, if you want to contact us and our upcoming webinar and the reports we produced. So we, we have an intermediate report that we published in, um, in September, fairly short, about 10 page. And then the, the big guide, uh, the page report. 
that we just published last week. So thank you for your time and uh, happy to answer any question at the end. Muchas gracias, Manuel. Eh, muy interesante, muy clara, ilustradora tu presentación. A continuación, voy a presentar a Andrés Leonardo Jiménez, que es subdirector de Sostenibilidad de la eh, Federación de Aseguradores Colombianos, Fase Colda, quien nos va a compartir la perspectiva desde una Asociación Nacional de Aseguradores sobre las recomendaciones del GCFD y cómo las entidades de seguros están gestionando y divulgando los riesgos climáticos en Colombia. Adelante, Andrés. Hola, buenos días a todos. Eh, muchísimas gracias por la invitación. Hoy voy a tratar de hacer como un recorrido rápido por diferentes temas que ha manejado la Federación en torno al cambio climático. Eh, no sé si podemos poner, por favor, la primera diapositiva. Una de las principales cosas que me gustaría abordar antes de empezar a contarles lo que hemos venido trabajando en la federación es la visión que tenemos respecto al cambio climático. En el sector asegurador muchas de las cosas que hemos venido trabajando eh, las hacemos mediante una serie de aproximaciones a lo que puede suceder en el futuro. Esas aproximaciones las hacemos basados en eventos pasados y mirando el pasado construimos el futuro. Entonces, si uno ejemplificara nuestras carteras, pues nuestras carteras en cada uno de esos casos sería ese conjunto de circunferencias y en la medida que va pasando el tiempo, nosotros vemos que estos eh, temas asociados a eh, los siniestros se podían predecir con una serie de métodos que no se veían alterados por otras, otros factores externos. Digamos que partíamos del hecho de que la temperatura media del planeta eh, no estaba aumentando y que las variables conexas a esa temperatura eran predecibles. Eh, siguiente diapositiva, por favor. ¿Podemos pasar a la siguiente diapositiva, por favor? Exacto. Eh, una de las cosas que sucede con el cambio climático es que los, los procesos que veníamos desarrollando para adaptarnos a entender cómo estaban nuestras carteras pues están sujetos a cambios y uno de los principales cambios es que el aumento de la temperatura genera cambios en las variables conexas, entonces en la precipitación, escorrentía, eh, velocidad de los vientos, etc. Y eso a su vez pues genera cambios en lo que podríamos esperar en nuestra siniestralidad, en nuestras carteras y requiere unos métodos de aproximación diferentes y es allí donde adquiere relevancia todo lo que está asociado al análisis de escenarios. En ese sentido, pues estamos bajo un reto porque estamos aprendiendo como aseguradores a incorporar una serie de herramientas, como lo acabamos de ver en la presentación anterior, que nos permitan eh, estar preparados para lo que está eh, enfrentando las aseguradoras en términos de las coberturas y los productos que estamos poniendo en el mercado. Siguiente diapositiva, por favor. Hay, hay un tema y es que, eh, si bien es cierto, se, se cree que el cambio climático va a empezar a generar efectos fuertes en la medida en que siga creciendo la temperatura, al menos en Colombia ya es un hecho lo que estamos viendo. Eh, nosotros hemos venido enfrentando diversos eventos climáticos bastante fuertes. En 2010-2011 enfrentamos un fenómeno climático de precipitación, de aumento en la precipitación, que inundó buena parte de zonas urbanas, de sectores eh, que estaban cubiertos por las aseguradoras, a tal grado que en temas catastróficos, pues, este, este evento propició una pérdida catastrófica pues, supera, que supera la mayor pérdida catastrófica que hemos tenido en la historia, que era un terremoto en, el, en, el, en, en la zona cafetera. Eh, y esto adicional a que los eventos no son siempre de tipo de aumento de lluvia, sino que también hemos tenido eventos de sequía. So, durante el 2014 también tuvimos un evento fuerte de, de fenómeno del niño que estuvo asociado a pérdidas de, de vidas animales, de, de biodiversidad en sectores eh, pues probablemente menos asociados a actividades productivas y por ende pues no tuvimos tanto impacto del sector asegurador, pero es un evento que ya muestra el impacto y el efecto que está teniendo el cambio climático sobre el territorio. Siguiente diapositiva, por favor. Uno de, las, de los principales retos que vemos desde la federación es, es que para aplicar todo este tema de metodologías eh, nuevas para la, la gestión del riesgo climático, se requiere empezar a, a ver este problema desde una visión sistémica. 
y una de las principales cosas que estamos viendo es que eh, por el quehacer de la industria aseguradora, las industrias son eh, una serie de compartimentos que están dados por el quehacer de los diferentes ramos. Entonces, a su vez tenemos un, un, un tema y es que, si bien es cierto, a nivel vertical eh, existen diferentes capas de conocimiento, diferentes capas de entendimiento del problema, a nivel eh, eh, de, de las líneas de negocio, cada una de las líneas de negocio procede de forma distinta. Entonces, ¿eso qué, qué hace? que en cada una de las líneas se tenga un entendimiento diferente y un avance distinto respecto al cambio climático. Esa, esa visión por silos, pues evidentemente eh, hace que la gestión del cambio climático en algunas líneas de negocio esté muy avanzada, en otras sea más lenta, y a su vez permite que se, se, se dé una serie de fricción para implementar metodologías que, que ayuden a toda la aseguradora, a, a una aseguradora en conjunto. Es así que se tienen, por ejemplo, avances en inversión, pero no se tienen avances asociados a la colocación de los productos o a la gestión del riesgo en los momentos de suscripción y esos avances dispares dentro de las aseguradoras, pues es, es un tema que eh, hace difícil la gestión integral del cambio climático. Otro tema que sucede dentro del sector asegurador es que el conocimiento es un conocimiento que se aprende en la experiencia, que se aprende en la práctica y las personas normalmente salen de las universidades, entran al sector asegurador y allí aprenden el quehacer del sector asegurador. Y eso hace que en la medida en que el riesgo climático es un riesgo nuevo, su bagaje de experiencia que les puede transferir el mismo sector no les incluye ese conocimiento del cambio climático. Entonces tenemos un reto y es que además de que las, las empresas son altamente compartimentadas, pues digamos que generalmente lo son, tenemos un reto y es que tenemos que incorporar el conocimiento de la gestión del riesgo climático al interior de las organizaciones para poderlo gestionar. Existen diversos expertos en cambio climático que podrían ayudar a las aseguradoras a gestionar este tema. Sin embargo, estos expertos generalmente no conocen bien el quehacer de la industria aseguradora y transferir el conocimiento requiere una serie de análisis o de, o de entendimiento del problema para poder generar los puentes necesarios y poder permear eso entre las aseguradoras y que podamos movilizarnos. Siguiente diapositiva, por favor. Eh, a partir de este momento les voy a empezar a contar de cómo hemos venido abordando este tema. Esto es una visión como de, de, algún, de selección de algunos temas en los que hemos venido avanzando. Entonces, una de las principales cosas que se hizo después del de, eh, fenómeno de la niña que les contaba del 2010-2011 fue que la federación creó un sistema de georreferenciación. Este sistema de georreferenciación lleva varios años madurando y en esa medida se ha vuelto un referente para la industria aseguradora. Este sistema le permite a las diversas aseguradoras en Colombia consultar temas asociados al, al riesgo climático para, para decidir cómo proceder respecto a los procesos de suscripción, gestión de riesgo e indemnización. Es un sistema que permite validar eh, una serie de variables, entre esas pues precipitación, erosión, escorrentía, eh, temas que, que son eh, asociados a los riesgos que ellos están suscribiendo un sistema que tiene alrededor de 180 mil consultas al año y que seguimos robusteciendo con información estatal, a tal grado que se, se ha venido consolidando toda la información que pueda tener eh, el país y a la cual podamos tener acceso desde la federación para que los aseguradores dispongan de la mejor data para tomar decisiones. Siguiente diapositiva, por favor. Otra de las cosas que hemos venido haciendo para tratar de vencer esa, esa barrera del conocimiento es crear un espacio de formación para las aseguradoras en las que les tratemos de transferir esas buenas prácticas en términos de gestión de riesgo a las personas que en su día a día ya trabajan dentro de las aseguradoras. Este ha sido un proceso en el cual hemos venido madurando, llevamos ya eh, casi cuatro años, hemos tenido ya tres ciclos, tres cohortes de personas dentro del sector asegurador que han sido formadas y esta escuela de sostenibilidad se ha, ha venido construyendo año a año atendiendo las necesidades de la industria, creando espacios especializados para transferir conocimiento en gestión de riesgo climático, y así como tenemos cursos especializados para formar a esas personas dentro de las aseguradoras y que puedan empezar a hacer una serie de análisis más avanzados en torno al riesgo climático. Siguiente diapositiva, por favor. Una de las principales cosas que hemos venido haciendo ya en términos de gestión del cambio climático es empezar a utilizar metodologías de análisis de escenarios para verificar nuestra exposición al, al riesgo climático. 
Eh, una vez hicimos el análisis, para nosotros era más factible hacer eh, aplicación de este tipo de metodologías para la parte de inversión. Y esto es relevante para el sector asegurador porque nosotros somos el segundo inversionista institucional más grande de Colombia y en ese orden de ideas, pues nosotros tenemos que garantizar que nuestras inversiones no estén expuestas a los, a, a, a los efectos del cambio climático. Y en este sentido, lo que hicimos fue aplicar metodologías de análisis de escenarios para verificar qué tan expuestos estaban nuestros portafolios a la transición económica producto del cambio climático. Eso es básicamente riesgos de transición y verificación de cómo nuestras carteras se encontraban alineadas con los acuerdos de París. Este es un estudio que ya está publicado, eh, que finalizamos en el año 2019, lo publicamos a principios de 2020. Es un estudio que utiliza metodologías que cualquier asegurador puede eh, usar, que son metodologías desarrolladas por Tudy Gris y que en su caso, en el caso de la federación, lo hicimos con el apoyo del gobierno de Alemania y con apoyo del BID. Eh, este es un primer acercamiento, digamos que es una línea base, es un estudio prospectivo para la industria que permite sentar un precedente y es saber cómo están nuestras inversiones en términos del cambio climático y a su vez permite crear una línea base para poder empezar a generar gestión sobre las inversiones. Siguiente diapositiva, por favor. Una de las cosas que notamos eh, en este proceso es que evidentemente el, el, la discusión en torno al cambio climático en muchos países y probablemente en Colombia también se ha venido enfocando mucho en la mitigación y eso ha dejado de lado en parte los procesos de adaptación y de gestión de riesgo que son de gran interés para la industria aseguradora porque pues evidentemente nosotros como parte de nuestro negocio nos dedicamos a gestionar riesgos y eso eh, nos pone como en una disyuntiva y es como trabajamos en mitigación. Una de las principales cosas que vemos cuando hicimos este análisis de nuestras inversiones es que en la medida en que nosotros aplicamos análisis de escenarios y buscamos alinear nuestras inversiones, nuestros portafolios de inversión en los diferentes instrumentos económicos en los que invertimos con una economía baja en emisiones, pues evidentemente nuestro dinero está impulsando actividades económicas que emiten una menor cantidad de gases de efecto invernadero. Eso nos nos disminuye la exposición al riesgo y a su vez, de forma implícita, está mitigando los efectos del cambio climático. Es probablemente otra forma de abordarlo, ya no estamos hablando de, directamente de la disminución de emisiones, sino de que la correcta gestión del riesgo climático implica necesariamente la disminución de emisiones eh, como parte implícita de las acciones que tomemos. Siguiente diapositiva, por favor. Eh, en ese orden de ideas, pues eh, en la medida en que ya hemos venido avanzando en inversión, ahí hay algo interesante y es que ahí hay una oportunidad enorme para el sector asegurador. Digamos que las inversiones en muchos de los ramos pueden ayudar al cierre financiero eh, que permite las, la, el ingreso de utilidades a las aseguradoras. Entonces, invertir en inversión en temas de riesgo climático es, es una gran oportunidad y a su vez es muy sencillo para las aseguradoras aplicar metodologías ya existentes porque en inversión hay mucho avance que se puede tras, trasladar al sector asegurador eh, de forma sencilla. Y adicional a eso, pues en la medida en que ya empiezan a vencer esa barrera del análisis de escenarios por, le, por la rama de inversión, es más fácil llegar a la parte ya de aseguramiento de las características del producto, de la gestión del riesgo de la suscripción. Y en este orden de ideas, esto es, esto es en lo que estamos trabajando actualmente, estamos trabajando en la identificación de los diferentes amparos o coberturas que tienen nuestros productos eh, y que tienen relación con el riesgo climático, como lo veían ustedes, eh, ya el tema de inundación, de movimientos en masa, de tierras, etc. Y en ese orden de ideas, pues en, en, confiamos el próximo año ya podamos empezar a hacer análisis que verifiquen cuál es eh, el, la cantidad de cartera que está expuesta, en dónde está expuesta, eh, cuánto implicarían pérdidas económicas y eso a su vez nos va a permitir identificar brechas de aseguramiento para crear nuevas soluciones de protección. Siguiente diapositiva, por favor. Es de notar que pues esta, esta dinámica que, que hemos venido promoviendo desde, desde la federación es un llamado a la acción eh, y hemos tratado de, de ser disruptivos promoviendo el cambio eh, el cambio no solo en el, en, el, en el sector asegurador colombiano, sino probablemente en otros sectores que también han permeado esa, esa dinámica de utilizar eh, metodologías de análisis de escenarios y de movilizarse a la gestión del riesgo. 
Eh, y en este sentido también hemos visto cómo nuestro supervisor, que es la Superintendencia Financiera de Colombia, ha sido bastante activo en promover la gestión del riesgo climático como un riesgo financiero y ellos eh, han venido aplicando una serie de instrumentos que permiten medir el estado de desarrollo de los diferentes actores del sector financiero en Colombia en términos de gestión de riesgo climático. Esto es una encuesta, ya vamos por la segunda aplicación de esta encuesta en Colombia y a su vez han venido empezando a trabajar en, en guías, en crear guías o manuales de buenas prácticas para para la inversión inicialmente, ya está empezando a permearse en otros temas y trabajan ahora en la taxonomía de inversión responsable pues para promover también la creación de instrumentos financieros en los cuales podamos colocar el dinero, que se sepa ciencia cierta, que apoyan o disminuyen el efecto del cambio climático. Eh, en este orden de ideas, la superintendencia financiera también ha promovido el análisis de escenarios en todos los actores del sector financiero en Colombia y es de notar que ya hace parte de la red para venderse, enverdecer el sistema financiero, eh, que es una red global. Entonces, pues, eh, siguiente diapositiva, por favor. Eh, eso es una visión general. Digamos que en términos prácticos, la federación ha venido implementando otra serie de herramientas para incorporar el cambio climático, sobre todo herramientas que se, que se asocian a la gestión de riesgos ambientales, sociales y de gobernanza. Muchísimas gracias a todos por, por este espacio. Excelente. Muchísimas gracias, Andrés, por tu eh, muy buena presentación y muy importante el trabajo que ha realizado, eh, sin lugar a dudas, Pasecolta en materia de sustentabilidad y que va abriendo camino para que otras asociaciones de otros países vayan tomando un mismo rumbo. Ahora voy a presentar a Andrew McFarlane, actuario jefe de AXA, AXA eh, formó parte del grupo piloto de aseguradoras que siguió las recomendaciones de CCFD. Andrew, welcome. Uh, sería interesante eh, conocer cómo en AXA probaron la herramienta y cómo encaja eh, con vuestro enfoque más amplio de modelado y fijación de precios. Thank you, Carolina, and uh, thank you for uh, good morning, good afternoon to all participants, and uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you. Uh, today on this webinar. Um, just a quick intro. So uh, AXA Excel, uh, we're a big global uh, insurer and reinsurer, um, focusing on multiple lines of business. AXA Excel is the commercial sort of arm of the AXA group. Um, the, the TCFD guidelines uh, really require that uh, we consider the resilience of our business strategy in terms of the risks that we're going to face um, as a result of the changing climate. And so, uh, you know, uh, the work that we have been able to do with Manuel and his team uh, with regards to the pilot work from uh, UNEP FI has been an important step um, in really creating that uh, framework, uh, which will allow the industry uh, to create that consistency And when it comes to making some of the disclosures that we're required to do under TCFD guidelines. Um, so the, the UNEP, pro <clears throat> the UNEP uh, project uh, is a, I think we need to say a big thank you to Manuel and his team. Um, it was a great opportunity for um, us at, at AXA XL and I'm sure the other partners to be uh, involved in this important um, and this sort of stepping stone piece of work. Um, my comments today are really going to focus on the physical risk aspect of that uh, work. Um, that was the area that we were uh, largely involved with. But I think it's important to reiterate and highlight the, the point that Manuel made around the interconnectivity of those three key components, the physical risk, um, the liability risk, and the transition risk. Whilst they're sort of looked at independently, as Manuel said, they are all linked, and it's important that as you go through thinking about the risks that we're going to face um, in, in the world of a changing climate, it's important to consider the, the interconnect interconnectivity of those three risks. So I'm going to frame my comments um, this, uh, this morning, my time, uh, under three main headings, really how we define risk when we think about physical risk, um, time horizons, and then risk and opportunity. So when we talk about physical risks associated um, 
uh, with ch a changing climate and just generally, we like to break it out into three components. You know, the risk is really a function of the hazard. Uh, so the, the, the natural peril that has the potential to cause damage, the exposure, the, the asset that is at risk from that uh, hazard, and the vulnerability, the, the extent to which um, that particular asset can withstand the hazard. And I think it's important that <clears throat> in the context of the physical risk, we break it down into those three key components. Um, because when, when we're trying to, when we're trying to uh, view or understand uh, how risk is changing in the future, we need to think about all those three key components and how they're going to evolve in the future. <clears throat> The, the, the excellent work that we have done uh, within the pilot group has really focused largely on uh, the, the, the hazard change, uh, keeping exposure and vulnerability constant. And those have given good indications and insights into the risk that we face. But I think the next step and an opportunity for that piece of work is again, as Manuel said, to broaden that out and look more at how exposure and vulnerability is gonna change in the future. Um, it's it's all three key components and then how they interact um, and intersect in the future. The time horizon is an important one and is is linked to that. Uh, the projections as, as Manuel uh, laid out around the, the various temperature um, pathways were at time, time horizons 2030, 2050. Um, typically insurance companies and businesses you know, run their business with a three to five year time horizon. And so there is a little bit of tension there between the projections that are being made and the way that we sort of run our business. And so it's important to be conscious of the fact that there are the, there is that slight disconnect. Um, but again, it's important that we have those uh, scenarios to give us that indication of where the risk might be changing. And then the third heading was really around risk versus opportunity. So. You know, within the work that we did, uh, there is certainly a lot of um, uncertainty in some aspects around particular um, movements in the direction and magnitude of certain events that we're going to face. Um, and it's important that when we're thinking about the context of uh, a changing climate, that where we sit as an industry, there is, there is certainly uncertainty that's going to e emerge and it's how that uncertainty plays out to whether it's a future risk and how that might relate to the opportunities that we as an industry have. So it's important that we, we consider the, the, the change in climate is going to create risks and opportunity within the context of the way we define risk as a function of hazard exposure and vulnerability. We obviously looked at a, a particular hazard um, the US and Japanese tropical cyclones where there are well-defined cap models in place, uh, which gives us some insight into um, the risks that we're exposed to. In certain regions, um, particularly, I guess, in, in Latin America, the, the existence of those cap models is not perhaps not so well-defined. And so I think when trying to apply some of the learnings that we had from uh, the work that we did within the pilot, I think some areas where you can, where you would be able to focus on or, or look into um, would be, as Manuel said, take, take the history that you have, the events that you have, um, look into the science that exists around potential changes in frequency and severity of those particular events and see how you could apply that uh, to form in a view in the future of where those particular hazards might evolve to. Um, overlay with that, it would be important to consider the changes that you might expect as a result of uh, exposure and vulnerability changes, because again, it's important to think about the intersection of those three, which really creates the risk. Manuel touched on it as well, but the, the importance of economic loss versus insured loss. Uh, so a lot of the work that has been done within, within the pilot has really been focused on how a, a particular set of scenarios now might change in the future um, related to a certain set of multipliers. There's the, the next step is really thinking about uh, how we can apply particular terms and conditions around the insurance portfolios that we all write and how that specifically relates to the risk that we face. And again, depending on the work that you do, um, if you focus on the exposure, if you focus on the hazard change and leave exposure and vulnerability and constant, 
the the important aspect there is to be clear what you're communicating. Right? It's it's um, be clear that uh, the the assumptions you're making is those two components staying constant, and the 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 results that you're getting are from a change in the hazard. It's important that that is well defined. Just touching on uh, some of the TCFD work in general, um, AXA was one of the founder, AXA group was one of the founding members uh, of the TCFD. Um, and so, you know, the, the framework, uh, sorry, one of the founding members of the TCFD. And since uh, then, for the past several years now, AXA has been, uh, has issued a, the AXA climate report on an annual basis, really within the framework um, of what the TCFD uh, has provided. AXA XL just recently come into the AXA family. We're on our, uh, we're on the path uh, towards uh, creating a, um, some reporting in, in the guidelines and in the structure of the TCFD. But the pilot has been an important step for us in terms of allowing us to think through some of these scenarios uh, within the framework that the TCFD has supplied. So again, you know, just in closing, um, I think the work from the pilot has been, um, you know, excellent work in terms of highlighting the three key components, as Manuel said, transition, liability, physical risk, a good framework and a good starting point uh, for the industry to sort of take on. I mean, I think within the TCFD guidelines, there is a lot of insight and a lot of information that exists around the assets and the investment side. Um, and this work is really the start uh, of some of the, the input and the, the guidelines and the structure that we need uh, to think about those risks from an underwriting perspective. So once again, a big thanks uh, to Manuel and the team, UNAPFI, for the opportunity to be part of this. And, you know, a really excellent first step um, in terms of creating those guidelines and that structure that we need as an industry. So I'll pass back to Carolina. Thank you very much. Estupendo. Muchísimas gracias, Andrew. Eh, Súper relevante todos los esfuerzos que han estado haciendo desde AXA y AXA XL en torno a esta materia. Ahora voy a presentar a Sebastián Raz, es oficial de riesgo de NN Group. Eh, bienvenido, Sebastián. Eh, te agradecería si pudieras contarnos sobre vuestra experiencia con GCFD y el proyecto piloto que acabamos de finalizar así como tu punto de vista sobre los análisis de riesgos físicos en áreas con límites potenciales en los datos y modelos y tu opinión sobre la ejecución de GCFD dentro de los procesos comerciales. Adelante. Muchísimas gracias, Carolina. Uh, thank you. My name is Sebastian Roth. I'm speaking to you today from Amsterdam. I'm very delighted to address you today at this uh, webinar. As a member of our working group, uh, let me just briefly introduce myself and our insurance group. Personally, I'm working with insurance groups since uh, 2002. I'm combining and improving two key areas. Firstly, uh, our ability to model, price, and ensure catastrophic climate risks at industry level. And secondly, our ability to deliver effective and scalable risk capacity. Both activities essentially focus on supporting societies, markets, and their ability to adapt to risk with resilience. At NN Group, I'm advising our board and our risk management strategy since 2014. We're active in 18 countries. Our history counts 175 years and was for many, part, uh, many uh, parts of those years uh, part of ING Group. Today, we serve 18 million customers, uh, providing insurance, investments, banking solutions, pensions, and retirement services. Now, for our webinar, let me share my three most important messages with you. Based on my work with the UNEPFI Working Group and producing this report. Um, all three start from one ambition, to manage climate risk well. I will talk to you about sharing a climate change language, about climate change commitments, and about climate change opportunities. Well, let us manage climate risk well. Firstly, by using a joint climate risk language for quantifying and communicating climate volatility and risk well. Our report, as it stands, endorses a harmonized scenario-focused framework. 
Its power here is that it is quite repeatable in an assessment style with components that are principle-based. This is valuable for underwriting. It's a powerful language. Tooling and methodology are essential steps for later acting and our reporting on climate change. They inform our climate change discussions and our actions. To be truly impactful, we need such a modeling framework that is simple enough and yet effective. It is a common language, especially when we express complex physics or the importance of transitional climate effects or the relevance of uncertainty in our management actions. Now, I believe we did succeed in pro proposing a scenario-driven quantification with reasonably clear reproducible steps. They help especially for our work on impact pathways and transition scenarios. A scenario modeling approach helps us address typical modeling dilemmas for scaling data, scaling timescales, addressing geographies, perils, and interdependencies. We proposed to focus on scenarios to manage climate risk well with the ultimate purpose to really enable local initiatives, local businesses, local adaptations, better local resilience and local change management. Now, this framework allows us to focus on explaining our scenarios and our conclusions, our approaches towards volatility. While we can cover what matters most, temperatures, rainfall, storms, floods, even in the Netherlands, droughts and heatwaves, or impacts on health. Now, secondly, let me focus on reporting our commitments. Our insurance sector has a leading voice for reporting on climate scenarios and climate metrics, working with partners and with regulators. We can show our capacity to team up and deliver. This also means that boardroom targets will develop across industry sectors and will face limitations to manage climate volatility because this is not easy. But now is the time to learn rapidly from each other on how we use our models and understand our scenarios. Dutch insurance groups, international ones like mine, are exposed to wind, flood, heat and health impacts of climate change. Just imagine, many cities, millions of Dutch buildings are centuries old. Their foundations are old and very sensitive to water level changes. This volatility only increases. For cities like mine, Amsterdam, there are no easy solutions. As NN Group, we commit to society to manage our exposures our assets with a forward-looking view, our carbon footprint and net zero targets. Therefore, we enjoy our interaction with DCFD and the PSI group. For our global markets, we build new climate-oriented solutions and we want those to truly make a difference. And UNEPFI is a key platform in this regard. Latin South America, you have plenty of opportunities to protect biospheres or to respond to warming. Temperature changes over night and day, changes in storms, rains and drought, or food security for that matter. Together, we are called to manage physical and transitional risk well. Therefore, with my third and last point, let me focus on how we develop new insurance solutions. Sharing a climate change language and reporting allows us to be better, to be faster in developing insurance opportunities and offering coverage and make our impacts. There's five points to that. Who will be securing biodiversity, green infrastructure and sustainable mortgages, for example? Who will set risk standards, communicate risk factors for adaptation and resilience? Who will strengthen supply chains or transparent ESG uh, scores? 
who will enable carbon-friendly activities in and across industries? Who can support healthy societies from the young to the old with a sustainable exposure to risk? I believe this is us, our insurance sectors and our actions. Therefore, to wrap up, uh, let me express that I hope that this platform will hear a lot from you about your initiatives, your actions, your climate targets and your solutions for customers. There's plenty of work ahead and this report with its framework leads us to new solutions and new commitments. Many thanks for your time and best regards from Amsterdam. Genial, muchísimas gracias Sebastián. Estamos un poco cortos de tiempo, ojalá que eh, las personas que nos están viendo ahora nos puedan seguir acompañando con las dos últimas presentaciones que también son súper relevantes porque vamos a contar con la mirada de los supervisores de seguros. En cualquier caso, eh, les recuerdo que este webinar está siendo grabado, así que podrían también ver la presentación después. Ahora voy a dar paso a Han Van Borden, es asesora principal de políticas de la Asociación Internacional de Supervisores de Seguros, IAIS. Ella va a presentar el borrador del documento de aplicación sobre la supervisión de los riesgos relacionados con el clima en el sector de seguros. Bienvenida y adelante, Han. Yes, so uh, thank you very much. Um, hello, everyone. Um, good morning. Uh, good afternoon. Buenos dias. Um, I hope you can all hear me okay. Um, thank you very much uh, for the invite uh, today. Uh, I'm really pleased to uh, present on the IAS work on climate change. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm a senior policy advisor at the IIS, the um, International Association of Insurance Supervisors, um, responsible for financial stability and sustainability. Um, so let's move to the, um, the first slide, please. Or the second slide, yes. Uh, so a really brief introduction to our work uh, for those of you who are maybe uh, less familiar with the work of the IIS. Um, so, uh, we are the uh, global standard setting body uh, responsible for um, developing um, standards for insurance supervision. And we have around 200 members worldwide um, covering, um, uh, covering uh, more than 90% of, uh, of the insurance sector. Our mission is relevant to both the micro and macro prudential objectives, um, as well as uh, conduct issues. Um, let's move to the next slide. So as mentioned, as the standard setting body, uh, we develop um, uh, globally accepted principles and standards for insurance supervision. And uh, these are, uh, first of all, the ICPs, uh, which many of you are probably familiar with, which is uh, the acronym for the insurance core principles. And these standards apply to insurance supervision in all jurisdictions and to all insurers globally. Next to that, um, in 2019, we developed ComFrame, uh, which is uh, short for the Common Framework for the Supervision of Internationally Active Insurance Groups, IAIGs, a whole mouthful. Um, and these were, um, this focuses really on group wide supervision uh, issues such as supervisory colleges, et cetera. Uh, to support our members, so insurance supervisors worldwide, in implementing these standards, uh, we also develop various supporting materials. Uh, these provide examples, case studies, and overviews of group practice. Um, finally, it is important to note um, that all the material that we produce um, uh, is, uh, is produced under the proportionality principle uh, what does that mean? It means that uh, the actual application of the requirements should be tailored to the nature, the scale, and the complexity of the actual risks facing the insurers. Next slide, please. And the development uh, on the work on climate change uh, has also been related to these supporting materials. 
But before uh, diving into that, uh, I will have to mention our, our strong partnership and really important partnership with uh, UNEP's Sustainable Insurance Forum, the SIF. Um, the SIF was uh, established in 2016. And uh, together with, uh, with them, we have been able to, uh, to deliver some key projects uh, in the last uh, couple of years, uh, which you can see on the slide. And um, there's also a link attached to it. So I think you can, uh, you can look it up uh, after the webinar. So first of all, in 2018, we published a, uh, an issues paper, which is uh, really uh, describing uh, how climate change may impact the insurance sector and as also insurance supervisors. And last year, in February, we released a paper on um, the uptake by insurers uh, on the uh, FSB TCFD recommendations. So uh, I think also very relevant for today's webinar. Our most recent joint work um, with the SIF uh, has been the development of an application paper on the supervision of climate-related risks in the insurance sector. It is meant to be a comprehensive guide for insurance supervisors on how to apply the IAS standards uh, to the specific risk posed by climate change. Uh, we published a draft paper in October last year for consultation and the consultation period ended really just a few weeks ago. Um, so unfortunately there's no um, uh, possibility anymore to comment on it yet, uh, but I. I can say that we have received uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, very, very informative and very helpful feedback, and uh, we are considering them uh, right now. So let me move to the next slide where, um, uh, again, as noted before, um, the objective uh, and the scope of the paper are, um, are addressed. So first of all, um, uh, the objective is really, uh, as I mentioned, uh, is to help supervisors in adopting, so to say, a climate lens to their day-to-day -day supervision, with the ultimate aim to better address risks from climate change and support a globally consistent approach. Uh, the paper focuses on six different topics, uh, as you can see here on the slide, related to governance, risk management, uh, disclosures, uh, and others. In the interest of time, I decided to only focus on, on three of those topics uh, in my presentation. And I think those are also the most relevant to today's topic of uh, disclosures. So let me start with the topic of supervisory review and reporting. On the next slide, please. So a starting point for effective supervision of climate related risks is for supervisors to really have the sufficient information and expertise to address the risks. Uh, therefore, in our paper, we recommend supervisors to assess the materiality of the risk within their own jurisdictions um, and how it may impact their own supervisory objectives and mandates. Uh, for instance, policyholder protection, financial stability, uh, etc. Key information inputs uh, will come from public sources, uh, such as TCFD report, uh, reporting, but also uh, from um, qualitative and quantitative information requests to the sector. Um, on both their exposures to climate risk, but also the management of the risk. Finally, I would like to highlight the importance of information sharing and cooperation, not only between supervisors, for instance, uh, as it relates to insurance groups uh, in supervisory colleges, but also between the supervisors and the industry to really foster information sharing and foster this important uh, work and, and share knowledge on, uh, on this also new uh, new element of, uh, of work. So uh, let, with that, let me move to the next slide, which is on um, enterprise risk management. So uh, the section on enterprise risk management in the paper is um, uh, deals with different, uh, really, really key concrete examples of uh, tools that can be uh, used to assess climate related risks. Um, and it, it deals with issues around uh, the risk appetite statement, uh, the RAS, underwriting policies, uh, but also very importantly, the own risk and solvency assessment, so the ORSA, and uh, scenario analysis and stress testing more in general. So therefore it also provides um, various examples of, of good practice and um, uh, around the world uh, to really uh, integrate um, a climate change risk into the regular enterprise risk management framework. 
And it's important here to note that um, the IS does not expect insurers or, or supervisors to really address climate change as a separate risk, but instead uh, we expect um, that insurers would uh, consider how climate change impacts uh, the existing financial risks um, in, uh, into their uh, risk management frameworks, so into their, um, into their regular processes. Uh, next slide, please. And then related to public disclosures, um, we also, uh, uh, the relevant ICP here, so the relevant ICP uh, standard here is ICP 20, which uh, requires that um, public disclosures uh, are, um, uh, are done by insurers uh, for, uh, for all um, material risks. And um, as such, uh, if information um, on climate-related risks uh, and the management thereof should also be disclosed. Uh, the level and the type of information, of course, may depend on the line of business and also it may increase over time as methodologies improve. So that's again uh, the linkage to the proportionality principle that I mentioned before. I, I realize that I only see my, my video right now, so I'm not sure if, um, if it worked before, but uh, that's hence my, uh, my little uh, hiccup there. So uh, when considering uh, mandatory climate risk disclosures, um, IAS does not um, uh, propose one, one set of uh, objectives, uh, but uh, we also note that uh, supervisors across the globe are taking uh, different approaches. Um, but we do recommend um, supervisors uh, to, to use the TCFD framework uh, if they want to do that for designing, for instance, best practices or as an input for setting their own expectations. And that's really meant, again, to, to really foster a global, globally coordinated approach. And um, finally, it's good to note that insurers could be allowed to meet any disclosure standards through public general purpose financial reports, uh, really to avoid um, uh, an additional burden uh, on, on the industry. So with that, uh, let's move to the final slide, which, uh, which focuses a little bit on uh, the next steps. So as I mentioned, the uh, public consultation period has really just ended. Um, we are considering uh, the feedback and are working on an updated version of the paper. And we plan to publish that um, uh, in, the, in the next quarter, so around April or May this year. And um, we are also doing uh, various other work streams on, on climate. So I wanted to highlight three, three of them here. First of all, from a financial stability perspective, we are working on considering uh, climate related risks on the investment side of the balance sheet. So it was really interesting for me to learn on uh, what has happened uh, happening there on, uh, in Colombia, which is a very, very interesting report, which I will, uh, will definitely read. Um, so we are doing an analysis on the global, uh, global sector, um, and currently we're undertaking a data collection amongst uh, IS member supervisors uh, to get information on the insurer's exposures to, uh, to, these, uh, to these risks, and we plan to publish this uh, around the middle of this year. Um, we also place a great emphasis on supporting uh, a coordinated, a global, but also cross-sectoral approach and uh, therefore we are involved in uh, various um, international bodies like the FSB but also the NGFS and this also includes again work on disclosures uh, but also around data gaps uh, which is another important element here. And finally we will um, continue the strong partnership that we have to SIF. Um, perhaps worth noting is their upcoming uh, discussion paper on how the biodiversity loss may impact insurance and insurance supervision, which I will be keen to, uh, to read when it comes out uh, later this year. Uh, so thank you very much for your time. Thanks all for staying a bit longer than uh, is initially planned and uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Han. Interesantísimo saber eh, de todo el trabajo, los avances que están haciendo en materia de cambio climático desde IAES. Así que felicitaciones por todo eso. Y nuestro último orador invitado es eh, Barcel Kuipers, experto principal en pensiones de la Autoridad Europea de Seguros y Pensiones de Jubilación, EIOPA, 
Él nos va a estar presentando brevemente la consulta sobre el proyecto de opinión en torno a la supervisión del uso de escenarios de riesgos de cambio climático en Orsa. Han eh, ya había mencionado lo que es eh, Orsa, pero para quienes no estén tan eh, familiarizados, es el acrónimo de Own Risk and Solvency Assessment, que significa evaluación propia de riesgo y solvencia. Así que bienvenido y adelante, Barstow. Thank you very much and uh, good morning to everybody or good afternoon to everybody. Uh, thank you very much for um, for uh, inviting uh, me, uh, Ayopa, uh, to the to this very uh, topical and interesting uh, seminar. Um, yeah, so I'm a principal expert at uh, the European Insurance and Occupational Pensions Authority, and uh, yeah, basically we are the European supervisor of insurance companies and uh, occupational pension funds. Um, I was asked, um, yeah, and also I think it's uh, very relevant to, to tell you something about uh, our work on the opinion on uh, the supervision of the use of climate change scenarios in the own risk and solvency assessment. Uh, and maybe the next slide, please. Um, I would like to give you um, a little bit of um, insight in that opinion. Uh, of course, uh, yeah. It's only a five to ten minutes, so um, um, uh, I cannot go into all the details. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of a bird's eye view. Um, but as you can see here, uh, I have also included the link to the to the consultation paper that was published uh, on the 5th of October. And this public consultation ran until uh, this month, the 5th of January. Uh, and basically, we are now also um, uh, like the IAS application paper in the process of um, uh, processing the, the feedback on that consultation, and um, yeah, in the in the in second quarter of um, uh, uh, of this year, we expect to publish it. Um, so, what is a, a supervisory opinion? Um, it's uh, basically a, a set of guidance expectations uh, addressed at uh, the national competent authorities uh, uh, within Europe, the national uh, uh, supervisors for insurance companies. And uh, the basic aim is to um, enhance supervisory convergence across EU member states. So, that is the main uh, objective of the opinions. Uh, and yeah, basically these opinions, uh, this opinion sets out um, expectations on the supervision of integration of climate change related risks, both in the short and long term, by reinsurance undertakings in uh, their own risk and solvency assessment. So basically, um, yeah, it's a set of expectations uh, to the national supervisory authorities, where they are uh, expected to uh, integrate that into their supervision. And basically, so indirectly, it's also a set of in expectations towards uh, European insurance companies. Uh, besides these expectations, and also because um, yeah, climate change and climate change scenario analysis is a relatively uh, new subject, we also um, yeah, included in this opinion, which, which is usually uh, very short, 10 pages, uh, a more elaborate annex, also providing guidance on, um, on how to conduct this kind of scenario analysis. And um, yeah, as you, and I think also the previous speakers mentioned it, um, a lot a lot has been doing, has been, is going on and a lot has been done. So we're also making use, also cross-referencing uh, much of the work that um, uh, has been done by others. So we're not going to duplicate all these things. Have to... Uh, not going, apologies for that. You're not duplicating all these things, but we're also trying to uh, summarize and, uh, and cross-reference um, uh, a lot of other work that has been done in this, uh, this, this area. Next slide, please. Yeah, so a little bit of, of uh, the reason why we um, uh, put forward this uh, supervisory opinion on, uh, on climate change scenarios in Orsa. Um, one, uh, yeah, basically, it's a follow-up to an IOPA, an earlier IOPA opinion on sustainability within solvency two, and that is, of course, the uh, the insurance prudential framework in Europe. And basically, the Commission asked us, the European Commission asked us whether, um, yeah, uh, uh, the existence of long-term climate risk warranted um, uh, an amendment of one-year uh, capital requirements, uh, which cover a one-year uh, risk horizon. Um, and yeah, basically our recommendation to the European Commission was that uh, 
uh, not to adjust uh, the, the, the Solvay2 standard formula for the capital requirements, but instead uh, we said, well, it's better that insurance undertakings uh, take into account these long-term climate change risks in their uh, governance, in the risk management, and also in their own risk and solvency assessment. Um, a second context was, and th that's basically a little bit how we started this project, is that uh, when doing a survey of uh, the existing uh, own risk and solvency assessment reports of insurance undertakings in, uh, in, in Europe, we found that only a small minority, uh, less than 30%, assessed climate change risks in their uh, OSHA using uh, scenario analysis. So that is still a very uh, small proportion. Uh, and uh, what we also saw is that, um, and I think that's also a little bit typical of own risk and solvency assessments of ORSAs, is that uh, most assessments took also a very um, short term perspective, one to five years, which is the sort of the, the common period in, in ORSAs. While, uh, yeah, uh, of course, you are aware that uh, climate change risk is typical, a risk that sort of um, uh, that, 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 that sort of materializes on a, on a much larger time frames, let's say. So basically these were also two important reasons for us to say, well, we have to draft an opinion about this also to encourage uh, insurance undertakings to, to, uh, yeah, to, to, uh, to do more uh, of these uh, climate change risk assessments, especially in the long term in their ORSAs. And uh, yeah, that's of course also, uh, not only interest of, of, of IOPA, but also in the interest of insurance undertakings themselves. Because if you sort of ignore these long-term risk or these uh, or uh, long-term opportunities, which they may also be, then uh, yeah, uh, if you don't include those in your in, in your uh, in your business strategy, your, your long-term business strategy, yeah, that might also jeopardize the future viability of your undertaking. So it's also uh, in the best interest of insurance undertakings to uh, do this kind of um, long-term assessments uh, within their ORSA and their risk management. Next slide, please. Yeah, so basically here I'm giving a little bit of an overview of, 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 of the main expectations on the slide that we uh, sort of um, uh, expressed in our uh, draft opinion. Uh, of course, the, the opinion is a little bit larger, so this is sort of uh, a few highlights. Um, but um, yeah, the, the first main expectation is that they um, that insurance undertakings take a holistic view of climate change risk and uh, that they cover both transition and physical risks. Uh, in the opinion, we also included, um, and that I think that Hannah also referred to it, uh, um, a, a mapping from these uh, transition physical risks to the, to the more traditional prudential risks. So to some extent, these are not uh, new risks, but they're sort of yeah, new drivers that they, uh, drivers of, of, tr uh, of traditional prudential risk that uh, they, they should take into account when doing their uh, risk management and when conducting their ORSA. Um, I think as a, as a, as a first step, we uh, expect um, uh, insurance undertakings to assess the materiality uh, of, of, of their uh, climate risk exposures. So it's an important step because we don't want them to uh, uh, do all kinds of uh, complex scenario analysis on risks that are not really material. But if they uh, yeah, uh, come to the conclusion that there are uh, material uh, long-term climate risks, we also expect them to, uh, to do at least, uh, to, to assess the risk using at least uh, two temperature scenarios. One, uh, where the temp global temperature rise stays below two degrees, another one where uh, global temperature increases exceed uh, two degrees. And an important reason for this is that, of course, yeah, uh, future climate change developments um, yeah, very much depend on the effectiveness of, of, of uh, gl global policy interventions, climate change interventions. And uh, as such, um, yeah, there's also considerable uncertainty and uh, an important uh, reason for doing scenario analysis is also to uh, show that uncertainty and uh, also for yeah, insurance undertakings to um, yeah, um, address that uncertainty uh, in the future. Uh, a last uh, important element of our um, of our uh, opinion is that um, yeah we uh, allow or uh, instruct NCAs that uh, insurance undertakings should evolve the scope 
depth and methodologies of their quantitative scenario analysis. And an important reason for that is that um, yeah, we don't expect uh, have, after the opinion is published that they, um, that insurance companies um, come forward with a, a fully quantified comprehensive uh, scenario analysis covering all the transition and physical risks uh, because uh, yeah, we uh, realized that would be um, uh, too soon, too much, too soon. And uh, one reason is that, uh, yeah, as we saw, a lot of insurance companies haven't started with uh, doing this kind of climate change risk analysis, just so they have to gain uh, experience doing this. But also, uh, yeah, not only insurance companies, but also supervisors um, uh, are, are, are just starting to to uh, has has just started to 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 look into these topics and a lot of these methodologies are still developing uh, more data has to become available so uh, it cannot be expected that uh, yeah from one uh, point in time to another point in time uh, there will be a, a perfect uh, a scenario analysis including all the risks but this is a rather a, a gradual process and i think that our opinion uh, also uh, yeah recognizes that then to my last slide, uh, the next steps. Maybe the next slide, please. Yeah, so as I, as I mentioned, uh, we just finished uh, a consultation period and we are now uh, processing all the, the feedback, uh, the very good feedback we received from, uh, from stakeholders. And our intention is to uh, publish the final uh, opinion in incorporating that feedback, taking into account that feedback in uh, April uh, this year. Uh, and we are also already envisaging uh, follow-up. So um, yeah, an important part of follow-up, of course, of an opinion is also to review um, to what extent uh, the opinion and the expectations contained in that opinion uh, have been taken in, into account. So that is one part of the follow-up that we're going to do as from the end of uh, this year. Um, a second follow-up is that we are, and maybe that's also a little bit uh, similar to what um, uh, 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 the, the pilot exercise of, of, the, of, of the UN uh, what has been discussed earlier today uh, uh, has been aimed for. So we are also intending to do um, a, a pilot exercise on a voluntary basis with um, yeah, se selected uh, or, or, or insurance companies that uh, would like to, to join that pilot exercise. And then we are especially, especially uh, targeting uh, smaller and medium-sized uh, companies that may be expected uh, that this kind of climate scenario analysis is more difficult to, to implement. Uh, and uh, yeah, in, in that pilot exercise, we would also like to yeah, assist these uh, small and medium sized uh, insurance undertakings in including this kind of climate change analysis in their orsas. So that basically those are, uh, this is uh, basically a sort of a, a practical follow up to the opinion also to help uh, insurance undertakings to to implement the opinion into practice. But this was a little bit of an overview uh, where we are now with uh, with uh, climate change scenarios in Orsa. Of course, also at IOPA, uh, sustainable finance is much broader than this. But uh, uh, yeah, I think this was an, a very important uh, part of our work, and still is an important part of the work. Uh, yes, thank you very much for your attention. Súper interesante, Barzol. Eh, vamos a estar atentos a cuando salga la publicación próximamente y también nos quedamos con las expectativas de EIOPA y la invitación que hacías a las aseguradoras en cambio climático y HSFD para ir avanzando en este camino. Así que hemos llegado al final del webinar y por ende tenemos que dar cierre. Eh, Manuel ha ido contestando algunas de las preguntas que hemos ido recibiendo a través del chat. Hemos contado con expositores de primer nivel, con información de vanguardia. Esperamos que les haya sido de utilidad. Y todos los organizadores y colaboradores, quisiéramos agradecer a todas las personas que nos han acompañado durante este evento en estas dos horas. Eh, como decía antes, nos hemos pasado un poco el tiempo, eh, pero igual era súper interesante poder conocer eh, todas las presentaciones y, y todo lo que está ocurriendo en Cambio Climático y el GCFD. Hemos contado con más de 
eh, o casi 300 eh, personas de muchos países que nos han seguido online. Gracias nuevamente y les deseamos que tengan una feliz semana.